Meow! Pulls cat and Becky the Terrier presents. I just want to talk about, about lessons from Wuhan from the initial outbreak. There's also an interesting uh, retrospective lab study showing which labs were affected, and that's really of interest to people who are able to test labs. Um, so I do, do recommend you follow the links in the description and have a look at this if you're a healthcare professional. And I would actually recommend you get this out and keep it for yourself if you're not. So as I said, this group was actually hospital staff a lot, workers from the whole food, the wet factory, and also uh, assisting patients and their families. That's what the initial outbreak was. And even so, comorbidities only existed in 46.4% of these people. In other words, 53.4% of the initial group had nothing wrong with them except for COVID-19. Okay? So don't assume you're fitting well and you're going to be fine. The other interesting thing was this, of those people who had one or more coexisting medical conditions, hypertension was 31%, diabetes was 10%, cardiovascular disease, which is existing heart disease or stroke or both, that was 14.5%. Cancer patients were 7.2. However, they had a widespread outbreak in their surgical floor, which was mainly oncology, and that's what uh, skewed that to making it look more prevalent. Wow. So, realistically speaking, your percentage chance of catching this over the age of 56 is the same as somebody who's under 56. And if you have a nothing wrong with you, you are more likely to catch this disease than somebody with a pre-existing disease. Statistics are fun. The bottom line is it doesn't matter if the death rate is 1%, 2%, 3%, or 9%. Nobody knows. And I'm thinking 3.4. It's looking high in that in quite a few places outside of China. Um, if it's the disease outbreak is 10 times seasonal flu. Seasonal flu kills 0.143% of the people that catch it. If 1% of the people who get this die and the others need ICU, we can't cope. If it's going to be 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10%, of the people that catch COVID-19 require ICU, require intensive hospitalization, the system will crash. This is why the governments of all types across the world are shutting down. They don't want people to catch this. Eventually they will, but they want people to catch this slowly <laughs> so we can try and deal with it from a healthcare perspective. Because it's not gonna look good in the modern age, is it? If like in Toronto they close the CN Tower, downtown but if we have to open up the Sky Dome the Rogers Centre and put 10,000 cots in there that's not going to look good right it's really not going to look good now the present mayor of Toronto uh, John Tory has COVID-19 disease the Prime Minister's wife Sophie has COVID-19 disease and I believe there's at least one or two more premiers in Canada across in different provinces and territories that have are in isolation. This disease is really prevalent. This disease is really prevalent in Canada. And if you are important enough and have tested for it, because most people like me are not tested for it, it's showing a lot of positives. It's widespread. We know it's widespread in Canada. We believe it's more widespread in terms of population percentage in the United States. A lot of people are thinking that. This is why Mexico is thinking of closing the border to America and Canada's talking about it. We're really concerned that America might end up with 200 million people with this disease. Think about how many people that is gonna die. Minimum of two million, possibility of 12. Nobody knows it could weaken and go away. But this is why it's concerning. And the other thing of interest, and I have actually copied this one, I put the slide up, is actually, uh, is uh, CAT scans, chest computerized tomography. So this shows the hourglass look. It's like, a, it looks like there's fine bits of glass scattered throughout the lung. That's pretty diagnostic. Now, what are the onset symptoms for this original cluster? What did they actually present with? What was, what were they complaining about? The most common symptoms at onset were fever, 98.6% had a temperature higher than normal. Fatigue, 69.6%. Okay, that means 31% of the patients who presented at hospital claiming to be ill actually felt fine, other than a symptom they had. That's really significant. This disease is designed to walk around in the community for a long, long time, passing itself into various human beings without being spotted. Malaysia, uh, which is uh, muscle pain, general not feeling great, that was about 35%. Shortness of breath for 
The other common symptoms have been listed in Table 1, you can look at them. Now I think it's really interesting that 10.1% of them presented with diarrhea and nausea one to two days before they developed fever and dyspnea. So one in 10 of these people who have COVID-19, their initial symptom for one in 10 of them is diarrhea, okay? No fever, right? No coughing. They're pooping more than normal. And I think that's a really significant finding based upon the fact that in your own home, you have to start monitoring people's bowel movements as well as their baseline temperatures and blood pressures and heart rates. And if you're stuck at home or if you feel like you wanna get prepped for this, you probably should start doing that now. You should be doing it every four hours, temperature, pulse, blood pressure, respiration, and bowel movements. One of the good things about this, it appears not to cause what Spanish flu caused, which is a high degree of craziness and insanity in people as they got shot of oxygen. This one, it appears just that the Glasgow Coma Scale is 15 out of 15, they're fully normal until they're sedated by the hospital or they die or they go to sleep. It doesn't appear to cause huge craziness and that's a thankful thing. So table four, I'll put that up. That'll show you uh, what complications the two groups got. Basically, everybody is on the left, the ICU groups in the middle, and then the non-ICU groups on the side. So you can see that obviously people that go to the ICU tend to have the most common complications. Just to let you know, AKI is acute kidney injury, which means their kidneys are failing. ARDS is the acute respiratory disorder. Now acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, is really complicated. Unless you're in the healthcare field, I wouldn't even look at it. It just means that you can't oxygenate them. Uh, it doesn't matter what you do, the lungs will not allow oxygen in, and in some cases will allow CO2 out, but not all. So out of the original cases, almost four, over 40% were thought to be caused because they were in hospital and somebody was infected near them. 29% of the original cases were healthcare workers. Quite clearly, non-protected healthcare work will kill you. N95s are required for nursing this type of patient because you never know when they're going to cough. And if they cough, you will inhale it and you are highly likely to get COVID-19 disease. The fact that many hospitals are claiming no, no, surgical masks are fine for this because they are too dumb to actually get the expired ones from the warehouse and put new rubber bands on them uh, is no excuse. Lawyers in Toronto and Canada have already told the governments quite clearly they're going to get sued uh, if they try and put nursing and other healthcare staff into COVID-19 rooms using surgical masks. And I agree with that. This is an absolute farce. Um, obviously, I won't be doing that. I'll be wearing an N95. Obviously, Kitty will be wearing an N95. And I am still looking at reusing the N95s. I've not recommended, but I think it's going to be essential. We're going to completely run out. Again, I haven't put this one up, but if you're into healthcare at all, this is kind of interesting. It shows you the lab parameters and over time, what happens to the lab results and certain specific lab results. And all of this was very useful. Um, I'm sure Italy's going to churn stuff out, but unfortunately, they're writing it in Italian, so it takes some time to get it transmitted into English. And certainly, as it rolls along, now, Spain's being hit on March 14th. Uh, Ontario, I think, were doubled, I think, in the last 24 hours. It is only a matter of time before this is not 130,000 cases worldwide. It's a million, then five, then 10, then 20, then 30, and 50 million. We might catch a break. The virus might mutate into something weak. The virus might mutate into something stronger. Worry about the virus we're faced with today. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you've got any questions, ask them below. I'll try and answer them. I am not a doctor. I am a registered nurse and I will do my best to answer the questions. I think it's really important as we go through this that I start to talk to you directly for this week and next week about specific things that you need to know. In my opinion, as a prepper and as a registered nurse, I also teach baccalaureate nursing sessionally at a university at the fourth year level in classroom. And I'm a hospital administrator, as some of you may or may not know which means at night I'm in charge of the whole hospital, actually three campuses and a lot of patients and it's a crazy, crazy job. So I'm not sitting in office all day having meetings because there's nobody to have meetings with <laughs> except for the staff who need the support. So this is going to be crazy. It's going to be very, very interesting times. It's March 14th. The clock is running. If you don't have food and you don't have toilet roll and you don't have this one and the other but at this point in time use unconventional means to get it go to camping stores online and order camping food do whatever you need to do to get a month's supply of food in i would actually recommend you get three months supply of food in 
Once this breaks, do you want to be going out and lining up with 10,000 people to get into Costco's to be given a limited amount of food? I don't. So remember, in SHTF tomorrow will always be worse than today unless you prep. And part of prepping is learning information, but learning information from science, not from video opinion. And I've given you my opinion, and I hope I, you see my opinion where I give it. One of the things is in a pandemic that's evolving, tomorrow will always definitely be worse than today. If you're having trouble right now, and I am, I'll be totally honest about it, I'm having a lot of trouble dealing with this emotionally. I actually burst into tears several times today. Um, it's terrible. I didn't expect this. I really didn't. I made a pandemic series in 2019 showing a terrible pandemic over the course of months and how it would affect me and Kitty. I didn't expect this. Uh, this is a shock. This is a reminder. This is a reminder that nature rules and we're here only on nature's sufferance. And we need to get our stuff together. We need to help each other. We need to not promote hate. We need to not promote fear. Most people will not die from this disease. Most people will get jobs back, most people will get the income back because there'll be a lot of overtime and it's going to be a good day at the end of the day, but from there to there, it's going to be difficult. We're in for a very bumpy time ahead of us. So stay safe, wash your hands properly, have no wristwatches on or hairbands or rings, get them off. Bacteria. <coughs> Bacteria and viruses can get under rings, get under wristbands, and you may then contaminate yourself later on. Try and keep your hands off your face. I'm really making a conscious effort to, but to do it is actually impossible, especially when you're sleeping. So one of the things that nobody's recommending as a free tip to you is before you go to sleep, change the sheets every day if you can. If you can, but change the pillowcases every day for sure. And wash your hands really, really well before you go to sleep. Right? So think about what you're doing. Stay safe. Don't freak out. This is SHTF Actual. This is a global temporary SHTF caused by a pandemic made by nature. We have to deal with this as people. We have to deal with this together. Everything is going to become very, very local for us. And we're not used to that. And there will be no driving around and going hither and thither. In China, they dug up major highways to stop people getting out. There's no particular reason why we won't. We have to stop people moving around. We have to stop them infecting each other. Or this will crush the healthcare system. Toodles. Bad Terrier 2020 production.